Okay. So that's sort of the end of the basic overview of virus structure replication genetics. And now I want to start going into the more clinically oriented lectures. Are there any questions before I go on? So we're going to start off with uh, influenza virus. Uh, <coughs> and we've already gone through its life cycle. Uh, it's an envelope virus. It has hemagglutinin and neuraminidase glycoproteins inserted into the envelope and you can see those as a sort of fringe around here, hence the term spikes. And influenza, true influenza, is caused by influenza virus type A or influenza type B or as I've already mentioned briefly, influenza type C can cause infections but uh, th those are mild infections and are not of uh, major concern here. Um, but you often get things mislabeled as flu. Um, free bile respiratory disease with similar systemic symptoms caused by a variety of other organisms, and those can include viruses, bacteria, um, can often very inaccurately be called flu. But, so the term flu is very widely used, and I'm going to focus on true influenza. Um, so here's an example of um, influenza uh, from DHEC. Um, unfortunately, this is an old slide. They don't publish this slide every year. Um, but what this shows is that this is the culture results from cultures submitted to South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control uh, for typing as according to whether they actually contained influenza, uh, and if so, which type of influenza was it? Was it A or B? Uh, and for this particular year, you can see that a large number of samples that were submitted because people thought that the patient might have influenza turned out not to be true influenza. Um, many other diseases present very similarly. Um, the true influenza, posi influenza positive samples started coming in here beginning of October, late November. This year they peaked around December and then they went down. Influenza virus in this particular year started coming up late. Um, the, the actual reg amount of A versus v, B varies from year to year, uh, and B isn't always later than A. Uh, this is just what happened this particular year. But what you can see is that this is, tends to be a seasonal uh, disease, and it tends to predominate during the winter months. Uh, and in fact, that is its original Italian name, and uh, you can ask Dr. Ganjemi to pronounce this more accurately next week, but anyway, it's Malathia influenzae perlistelli, or the illness influenced by the stars, uh, because they associated it with the particular time of year when there were particular constellations high in the sky. So it has a huge number uh, and a major impact. Uh, it's frequently regarded, oh, you know, the flu is not so uh, serious, although with all the um, stuff about possible pandemic flu, particularly pandemic avian, avian influenza these days, um, I think the public is getting better informed. Um, but if you look at the deaths, in, in 1918 there was a strain of flu known as the Spanish flu, uh, which killed 20 million people worldwide. And it c killed half a million people in the US, many of whom were young, healthy adults. So it was a, a major Disaster, And when you think what the population of the U.S. was then, I don't know what it was, but it was less considerably, it was less than 100 million. So it's a huge uh, amount of illness, uh, death, and it was really serious. Fortunately, most strains of flu are not this pathogenic. Um, but we had another strain of flu which caused a major, pro major problem in 1957-58, and it's estimated there were 70,000 deaths in the U.S. from that, maybe a few more. So this can cause major problems when we have these uh, pandemics. Uh, but even in years when we don't have a major pandemic, on average, there are about 36,000 deaths from influenza a year. So this is not a minor disease. And there are many more hospitalizations. And actually, the more that CDC investigates it, the more these numbers tend to creep up because very frequently, um, the actual cause of the illness is not uh, always recorded. So uh, as we get better diagnostic techniques. These numbers are creeping up. 
And one concerning thing recently is that recently the morbidity and mortality from influenza has been slightly creeping up. Uh, and one possibility is we have an aging population and as you're going to be practicing, you're going to see an even more aging population. So um, we're, going, we're entering out of the baby boomers into the um, oh, geriatric boomers. Uh, <coughs> Um, also, you've got certain diseases, um, patients who at one stage wouldn't survive so well uh, and are surviving for longer, for example, cystic fibrosis, but other diseases where patients who would be prone to uh, getting influenza um, now are surviving long enough to be, for it to be more of a concern. There are more high-risk neonates uh, around, more immunosuppressed patients. Um, so all of these things maybe increase the number of people who are particularly vulnerable uh, to influenza. Okay, so to look at the viruses, as I said um, yesterday, they're pleomorphic. In other words, when you look at them in the electron microscope, although they're approximately spherical, you can find some which have got rather different shapes. Uh, they, these are the telephone cord in the loose plastic bag type of virus, um, and there's room for that to twist and shape uh, and so on. Uh, there are three types, and I'll go into those in more detail in a minute. Uh, and they typically cause a febrile uh, disease, respiratory illness, um, but you get a lot of systemic symptoms. Okay, we went into the structure yesterday. Notice in particular, remember these hemagglutin and neuraminidase because they're going to play an important role when we come to the epidemiology. Notice the segmented genome, as we talked about earlier on this morning. This segmented genome means the possibility of reassortance, and that's going to be important in the epidemiology. Uh, um, when it comes to determining which influenza type you have, um, types, all of the type A will have the same serological properties for their nuclear capsid protein and their maturation protein. So you type these viruses according to whether their nuclear protein and their maturation protein. And similarly, all type Bs will have the same serological property and all type Cs. So that's how you determine which type you've got. The outer proteins, as we'll see later on when we talk about the epidemiology, the hemagglutin and neuraminidase are very much more variable. So you can get type A influenza, uh, which has got rather ser very serologically different hemagglutinins and neuraminidase from other type A influenzas. And so those determine the subtypes. The type of hemagglutinin and the type of neuraminidase determines the subtypes of these viruses. And we'll be going into that in more detail in the next lecture. Okay, so how is flu virus transmitted? Um, it's transmitted largely by aerosol, it's thought. Um, you can, when you sneeze, if you don't use all the right um, precautions, um, you can emit a million virions in a droplet of aerosol. So that's a pile of virus. And even <laughs> if only 10% of it is infectious, you've still got 100,000 virions. So you can, submit, you can emit huge amounts of viruses. So the standard thing is that small particle aerosols, which can get down into the lungs, uh, are the standard means of transmission. However, it can also survive on surfaces. So you can pick it up from surfaces. It doesn't survive for very long, uh, but if somebody um, puts their hand over their nose, sneezes, puts it on the door, and then you push the door immediately afterwards, you can pick it up. So you can pick this up from fomites, i.e. from surfaces in the environment. Not for very long. It's an envelope virus. It's not terribly stable envelope virus. It's very easy to inactivate. Remember, because it's enveloped, things that affect lipids can easily inactivate it on surfaces. So you can easily wipe surfaces and get rid of it. Uh, with ethanol-containing, detergent-containing wipes. Uh, but you can also pick it up from surfaces if they haven't been cleansed. So one thing is if we have serious pandemic, is hand-washing, cleaning surfaces uh, can be an important part in controlling the spread, as well as good nasal hygiene. So you either breathe it in, or maybe you touch a surface and then touch your nose and start off the whole process. Uh, 
So not touching your nose is also an important part, as I say. Nasal hygiene, both on the way out and the way in. Um, it has a pretty brief incubation period. This virus grows very rapidly, as do many viruses, uh, but it grows in the respiratory tracts. The symptoms come from where it initially grows, so this is a very rapid procedure. Uh, so it grows very rapidly, and you start getting the symptoms within a day or two of the original infection. And you start shedding the virus at the same time periods. So this is a very quick, rapid thing. Now, I'm not going to quiz you on the exams as to whether it's 18 hours, 72 hours, 96 hours. But what, I, what is important to know with these viruses is whether the symptomatology is very rapid or it takes weeks to develop. Because if it's very rapid, you haven't activated the specific immune system. So the initial events here are going to involve non-specific immunity. Whereas if it's a slow process, as we'll see with things like mumps and measles, very often the symptoms are the consequence of the specific immune uh, system responding. So the symptoms you see are often after the virus is actually replicated at the peak of replication because it's, when your, it's your response that causes you to feel ill. It's a good thing because you clear the virus, but it doesn't feel so good at the time. But here, this is a very early response, so you won't have got the specific immune system activated. You won't have uh, cytotoxic T cells. You won't have antibodies in this time period. And as I say, you shed huge amounts. Uh, and this is just, this is actually a ferret because it turns out ferrets suffer from flu in very similar ways to humans. Um, but this is similar to what you would see in a human. So if you look at the mucosa of a normal trachea, you've got all these nice epithelial cells with their um, uh, cilia. Um, and they will be beating the mucus up that's secreted by the globet cells up towards uh, the environment so that they continually keep the lungs clean. So you've got this mucociliary elevator that is keeping the lungs clean. Uh, but look what happens in an infected virus, in an infected trachea. You, you lose all these ciliary cells uh, and they're going to take a time to recover. So here's a week later and they're starting to recover. So one of the things that's a problem with influenza is the epithelial cells are no longer having that mucociliary elevator so things can accumulate down in the lungs. You start getting some gaps in that protective layer. And so one of the problems is that you're going to be much more sensitive to secondary infections. So a lot of the problems with influenza are the secondary infections as well as primary influenza. So what you get is decreased clearance and increased risk of bacterial infection. Um, the virus tends to stay locally in the lungs. Um, you don't get a viremia, uh, or at least you only rarely get a viremia with influenza virus. So how do we recover? And as I say, we start our recovery before we've had time to really switch on the specific immune system. So a lot of the initial uh, period you actually start to control the virus by non-specific uh, non um, immune system. Uh, and one of the important components in influenza here is interferon. And we'll go into that in more detail in a minute. So I, I forget at the moment about interferon. Um, but interferon will protect against the disease getting out of control, but it doesn't clear the virus. You're still going to get a cell-mediated immune response uh, and that will be involved in, in really tidying up the infection. Uh, and one of the things is that tissue repair can take quite some time. Uh, so the symptoms can be prolonged even after the virus is clean because you've got to uh, clear it. You've got to repair that lung surface. So I said about interferon, and this is where I have to change and become that dreaded thing, an immunologist, or at least... I never become an immunologist, but I have to talk about an aspect of interferon. Okay, so interferon can be very important non-specific immune uh, defense against viruses. Uh, it comes into play very quickly. And so what it can do is it can keep the virus, these viruses under control until you have time to develop the, immune, the specific arm of the immune system uh, and really come in. So if we look at, at a kind of um, typical virus, uh, if you look at the days post-infection, and this is an approximate thing, 
Uh, what you will see is the virus will replicate, in the case of influenza, it, it replicates early and rapidly, and then it will fall off. Uh, and the fall off is because there's some kind of host defense going on. Um, and if you look at the specific immune system, it doesn't get activated for a few days later. The cytotoxic T cells tend to come up earlier, and then finally you'll get antibody production. So if we're looking at the early few days of influenza, um, you, you takes a lot longer to develop the antibody. The cytotoxic T cells will come in after a few days and start helping. Uh, but originally, uh, one of the, the important, a couple of important hormones include the natural killer cells, uh, which can kill virally infected cells, uh, and interferon. And I really want to go at the moment into this interferon. So as I say, this is a typical response to an acute virus inf infection, not just influenza. Uh, but influenza is an example of where it potentially uh, plays a really important role. So here I've shown some happy cells um, that are just going about their life. But then one of these is going to get infected with a virus. And initially this will be a happy cell, but as the virus replicates, uh, this cell is going to be killed. Uh, but one of the things is that, the virus, that this cell senses that there's virus in it. Uh, and that apparently is frequently due to double-stranded RNA. And I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, but so it senses that there's, the virus is present in it. And as a result of that, um, there's a response which res involves the release of this protein. Well, it makes the message for this protein, and then that's translated in this cell. And then the protein is released, and the protein is interferon. So this interferon can now diffuse about, and it will find receptors for interferon on adjacent cells, binds to those receptors, and starts a whole pile of signals going on. And those signals have many effects. So there's a whole pile of genetic changes in these cells, gene expression changes in these cells, uh, as this interferon starts signaling. And it's estimated that there's at least a couple of hundred and probably more genes that change in their expression as a consequence of this interferon binding to these cells. And so I'm not going to talk about all of those. We don't even know what all of them are. Uh, but one thing that these, these change in gene expression does to these cells is it makes them resistant to virus. So they develop an antiviral state. So as time goes on, this cell will die uh, because it wasn't able to develop that antiviral state in time. Uh, but these cells, when the virus enters them, uh, they will have this antiviral state. The virus won't be able to replicate, and we'll go into in, in a minute to some of the mechanisms. Uh, the virus won't be able to replicate, and it's not terribly stable. So after a few, I don't know, overnight 24 hours, of a, a relatively short period, um, it, this virus, if it doesn't start replicating, is going to get disposed of in the cytoplasm, uh, and it will no longer be infectious. And then these cells will be free uh, of the virus, uh, and that will be good. So this cell, basically, uh, it died, but as a consequence of what it did, it's protected the cells around it. <coughs> so the, the virus will disappear from these cells, and they will be able to go on with life as normal. So this is very powerful stuff. Okay. Um, one way to think of it is it's kind of like Paul Revere's right. So the initial infected cell around here said, instead of the British are coming, the viruses are coming, and it sent out its interferon message to tell the surrounding area that the, virus, that the, the British or the viruses, whichever you want, are on their way. So <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily save itself, but it does help the surrounding area to be saved. So there are multiple types of interferon that cells produce. Uh, and in terms of the virus infection, mainly what I'm going to be talking about today are, are type 1 interferon, which is interferon alpha and interferon beta. They have very similar effects, um, but interferon alpha tends to be produced more by leukocytes, and it's a whole family of proteins. Um, and interferon beta tends to be produced more by fibroblasts and epithelial cells, but um, there's not a clear-cut uh, difference, but it predominantly alpha is produced by leukocytes and predominantly beta is produced by other types of cells. 
Um, there's another type of interferon, which is called type 2 or gamma interferon, and that tends to be produced by a, a, immune cells of the, non of the immune system, including activated T cells and natural killer cells. Uh, but as far as virus induction of interferon goes, they normally uh, induce these initially. Okay, so what causes interferon alpha and beta to be induced? Viral infection, especially RNA viruses, uh, and double-stranded RNA. And one of the reasons that we think uh, RNA, viral infection tends to cause it is if you think back to the replication lectures, we said when you replicate your RNA, you have one strand, which we'll call arbitrarily Watson strand. That's copied into Crick. That's copied into Watson. There's no other way to replicate your RNA other than copying it into the complementary strand and then copying that back into the original strand if you're single-stranded or making double-strand RNA copies if you're double-stranded. So what you find is that inevitably, if you're an RNA virus, you're going to have both strands in the cell. And a lot of the complications of RNA virus replication that I haven't gone into seem to be involved in finding mechanisms to try and keep those two strands which would hybridize and form double-stranded RNA apart from each other. Uh, and that explains quite a lot of the nitty-gritty that we haven't gone into of virus replication. But one obvious point I pointed out to you is the double-strand RNA in the, in the real virus family is always in nuclear capsids because at least that keeps that protected away from this immune response system. Uh, but all of these viruses inevitably, some of this goes a little bit wrong when you're producing this much RNA and you get double-stranded RNA in the cytoplasm. If you think back to DNA viruses, um, adeno would be the typical example I gave you. Uh, but if you remember there, the early gene products were often, if you think back to that green and red picture, the early green products were being translated from one strand at early times, and the late products were being translated from the other strand at late times. So again, you would have complementary RNA. The, mess the late messages and the early messages would be able to hybridize to each other. So what you tend to get is a lot of these viruses produce double-stranded RNA as a consequence of their replication. And while they try and split these things into early and late and try and keep the, have all sorts of mechanisms which stop the negative and the positive strands getting together, um, inevitably they eventually do. So you get a double-stranded RNA is commonly seen in virus infections. Um, and certain bacterial components, things like lipopolysaccharide, will also induce uh, these interferons. And these alpha and beta have very strong antiviral uh, properties. Interferon gamma... Uh, it tends to be induced by things like antigens uh, and mitogenic stimulation of lymphocytes. We said that's the immune one. So I've already said interferon produces many proteins in these target cells, many of which we don't know and we don't understand why they should introduce an antiviral or even antibacterial environment. Uh, but some of them we do, and I'm going to focus on three in particular which are induced by interferon alpha and beta, and these have strong antiviral properties. Okay, so here we have interferon alpha and interferon beta. They bind the cell surface to the interferon receptor, and then they send off their messages to the genome, and messenger RNAs for three proteins are made. Uh, and this is a protein called 2 prime 5 prime oligo A synthase, uh, a ribonuclease, and a protein kinase called protein kinase R. 2 prime, prime, 5 prime oligo A is rather like, we have poly A tails at the end of our messages, and those consist of short stretches of A, which are linked together as in regular RNA by a 3 prime, 5 prime linkage on the sugars. This is a similar short length, shorter than our poly A tail, so it's called oligo, uh, but it's not linked 3 prime, it's linked 2 prime. 5 prime not, rather than 3 prime, 5 prime. So it uses the other hydroxyl group on the uh, ribose sugar to link it. Uh, but basically, it's just a little oligonucleotide with an unusual link. And I'll come back to the importance of these in a minute. Um, so what does ribonuclease L do? Well, it degrades messenger RNA. 
And what does protein kinase R do? It inhibits protein synthesis by inhibiting initiation of the ribosomes. So what happens is if you've got a cell which is expressing these proteins, the message will be degraded, and even if it's still around, the ribosomes will be inhibited from binding to it and making proteins. So when these are fully activated, uh, your message is being degraded, your proteins are not being synthesized. Now, these don't distinguish between viral messages and host cell messages, um, so the host cell will also suffer from having its message degraded and its protein synthesis being inhibited. Uh, but one of the things is that if this just lasts for a brief period of time, the host cell can frequently hold on, whereas the virus, if it doesn't get a quick footing in the cell, will soon be degraded. So the idea here is that you degrade all the RNAs and inhibit protein synthesis for a short period of time, end of virus, and now you switch them back on and you're okay. Uh, but basically it's toxic to the host cell and so one thing is these are not made as the active proteins because if they were made as the active proteins, you'd inhibit RNA, you'd inhibit RNA translation in all the cells of, that are affected by interferon and you'd also degrade all their message and that's not going to be a good thing in the long term. So you only want this to be transiently expressed while the virus is there. But when the virus hits the cell, you want to be ready to express it. You don't want to have to make until so you've made the message and translated it. <laughs> So what happens is these proteins are made as inactive forms, all three of them. And then what happens is when a virus comes here, you get double-stranded RNA in the cell. And these are all activated directly or indirectly by double-stranded RNA. So this 2 prime, 5 prime oligo A synthase is not active until there's some double-stranded RNA in the cell. That's going to only occur when the virus enters. So it knows the virus is around, it's made these proteins, but the virus isn't actually going to activate this until it actually enters the cell. And the similar thing for the protein kinase R. It's activated by double-stranded RNA. So as soon as you get double-stranded RNA in the cell, this will become active and will inhibit protein synthesis. This will become active and it will make 2 prime 5 prime oligo A. And the 2 prime 5 prime oligo A can now bind to the ribonuclease L, which was made as an inactive form, and activate it, and then the messenger RNA will be degraded. So if we go back to the Paul Revere thing, if Paul Revere got there before the British troops and said, hey, the British are coming, what you do is you get all the people in the right place, you get your arms, you set up your ambushes, whatever, you get ready. But you don't start firing your bullets until the British actually arrive. Because if you did that, it's just crazy. You're just going to kill each other. You're not going to do any damage to the British. Uh, and it's just a waste of resources. So this is kind of like that. You've got everything ready to go. Everything is in place. But you don't actually let it go until you get the virus coming. And then you let the double-stranded uh, RNA activate these. And as I say, that act, this activation of the 2 prime 5 prime oligo A activates the ribonuclease. Then you degrade the RNA. Then you degrade the protein. And also, you only express this for a limited amount of time because once the virus is gone, there's no point in keeping on with this warfare. Uh, what you want to do is get back to, to normal life. So this tends to be a transient response. It's made, and after a relatively short time, um, it goes away. The interferon goes back down again. So most cells, you don't normally express interferon in your cells so that you're always prepared to react against viruses because these, this is potentially too dangerous. Um, so what you have is you, you usually just activate the interferon pathways when there's a threat. And then when the real thing arrives, um, these uh, inactive proteins are activated and you really do the whole thing. So many cells will survive this because, as I say, they can hold on much longer than the virus. Uh, but in some cases, actually, the activation of these will actually kill the cell as well. But the general attitude is if a cell dies, it's not going to pass on the virus to other things. So death may be preferable to passing the virus on. Any questions? Okay. So this is, these are just three of the proteins that these interferons activate. There are many more, but this is a pathway that we particularly note about. Uh, and it, what it does show is the way in which you have multi-stage control things so that cells don't just 
fire off randomly. Um, they really wait until the situation is, is correct. So as I say, they're only made when needed, partly because of these toxic side effects. Um, so what else do interferons do? Um, they, all types of interferons, alpha, beta, and gamma, increase MHC1 expression. Um, so that means that the antigens are much more efficiently uh, presented to the cytotoxic T cells. They all activate natural killer cells, so they improve the ability of your natural killer cells, which of course are not part of the nonspecific immune system and, and react very quickly. Um, they increase their ability to kill the virally infected cells. So this is an important part of the nonspecific immune system. Uh, interferon gamma has some somewhat different uh, properties as well. Um, and it can also increase MHC2 type expression on the antigen presenting cells. Um, so it actually increases uh, helper T cells uh, as well, uh, activates those. Uh, uh, or indirectly by in improving the antigen presentation. Um, and it also increases the antiviral potential of macrophages. Um, it increases what's called their intrinsic uh, antiviral state. Macrophages uh, sort of innately, uh, viruses do not grow well in macrophages. Macrophages tend to have some of these antiviral uh, mechanisms being expressed. But in the presence of interferon gamma, those are upregulated. Macrophages also have what's called extrinsic antiviral effects. In other words, they can go and kill cells that are um, other cells. And so uh, that is called their extrinsic uh, activity. And it, it increases these. So the macrophages become resist much more resistant to virus themselves uh, and much more activated in terms of their other effects. So interferons have got some therapeutic uses. They're used as antivirals. You'll hear about this in the hepatitis lectures next week. Um, they can also uh, be used for um, diseases in which activation of macrophages would be an advantage. And in that case, you use interferon gamma. Um, they have been used to try and improve some uh, anti-tumor therapies. Uh, and there's been some limited use of those. And currently, they're also being used in, in multiple sclerosis. They seem to have some positive effects there. But, oh, um, but viruses um, can respond to these. So what you may find is viruses may actually interfere with the interferon system. Uh, they may block interferon binding. They may inhibit the function of those interferon-induced proteins. So they may inhibit that protein kinase R. And they <coughs> may inhibit the ribonuclease. They may inhibit natural killer function. They may interfere with MHC1 or MHC2 expression so that, that those are actually down-regulated rather than up-regulated. Uh, they may block activation of complement. Um, they may inhibit apoptosis. The viruses um, have got mechanisms that may tend to override some of these. Fortunately, at the moment, influenza does not uh, seem to overcome the interferon response. Advantage of a small virus, it doesn't have too many genes to kind of fight back. But there are some disadvantages of interferons, and one of those, or several of those, they tend to cause elevated temperature, fever. They tend to make you feel pretty lousy. You get malaise. You feel very tired, uh, and you frequently get muscle pain. And if you think about these, these are rather typical of the symptoms of influenza, and it seems that many of the symptoms of influenza are actually due to the interferon. So next time you have influenza and you feel really grotty, um, you can at least blame the interferons, which gets me back to influenza, but we'll pick that up in the next lecture.